welcome you to this video tutorial today we will discuss oxidative phosphorylation with experimental evidences in earlier video we have seen the nature of electron transport chain and also we have seen that what are the components of the electron transport chain in this lecture we would like to explain how there is a coupling between electron transport chain and how there is a generation of ATP. So by definition oxidative phosphorylation means generation of ATP from ADP diphosphate and inorganic phosphate or pyrophosphate in presence of mitochondria in mitochondria during electron transport from reduced NADH or FADH to oxygen or we can also say that it is a synthesis of ATP molecule by coupling ADP with inorganic phosphate in presence of ATP synthase with the help of energy liberated during electron flow from reduced coenzymes to oxygen where electron transport chain is known as oxidative phosphorylation. So in both the definitions, you have seen that there is a synthesis or the generation of ATP, which is coupled with electron transport chain as well as with the oxygen. And we know it is the final stage in all respiratory catabolism. Having said, we'll see what is the mechanism of oxidative phosphorylation. Mechanism of oxidative phosphorylation have been explained by several hypotheses. One, one hypothesis is the chemical coupling hypothesis, which was given by the Edwards letter in 1953. Second is chemiosmotic hypothesis proposed by Peter Mitchell in 1961. For their excellent, for this excellent work, they were awarded, Peter Mitchell was awarded Nobel Prize in 1978. And of course, there is one more that's called the conformational coupling hypothesis, which is given by the Paul Boyer 1964. Also, they shared a Nobel Prize for the same discovery. So let us discuss few of these hypotheses. The one hypothesis which is widely accepted, now it's a theory because there are experimental proof with it, that is called as a chemiosmotic hypothesis. According to this theory, energy liberated during downhill transport of electrons performs the osmotic work of accumulating protons across the membrane, which in turn creates sufficient proton motive force, delta P, or electrochemical gradient, delta E, which is utilized in coupling of ADP with inorganic phosphate to form ATP. This definition will be clear. We will explain it in, in future uh, slides. Before we will discuss the mechanism of oxidative phosphorylation, I would like to refresh your memory that what is the nature of the electron transport chain and how are the complexes involved in the generation of proton gradient. We have seen the mitochondrial membrane has inner membrane has number of the electron transport complexes and their carriers electron carriers and those include complex one and complex second complex third and complex four we we have discussed it here let us let us again uh, mention here that the complex one when nadh a reduced coins reduced NAD is fed to the complex one its electrons are passed to redox centers like FMN iron sulfur proteins and then it's passed on to the mobile carrier which is coenzyme Q coenzyme Q becomes reactive at and it takes protons from the matrix side and then translocates the electro protons towards the intermembrane surface as well as passes on the electrons to the complex third 
Similarly, this complex is also responsible for the translocation of four protons, complex one. And then from here, electrons are going to iron sulfur and cytochrome C1, and then through a mobile carrier, cytochrome C, only one electron is carry, carried at a time to a complex fourth, which, which is made up of copper, cytochrome A, and cytochrome A3. Copper exists in its two forms. We have already discussed it. And here, the last point is where the oxygen is the ultimate acceptor of electrons and it takes protons to form a metabolic water. And at the same time, it also translocates two more protons towards the inner membrane space. So when one NADH is fed to complex one, 10 protons are translocated or pumped towards intermembrane space. So there will be a creation of a proton gradient on this side. It will be more positive charged. Here we will have a negative charge. And when the FADH is fed to succinate dehydrogenase, which is the only enzyme of the TCA cycle located within the inner mitochondrial membrane, that time it goes to the complex second, which is succinate dehydrogenase, forms fumarate and protons and electrons are passed to this. It does not pass on the protons towards the inner membrane space. And similarly, it goes to the mobile carrier co coenzyme Q. Two electrons given to this, two protons are translocated. And then again, two protons are translocated by complex third. And then electrons are passed on through cytochrome C to the complex fourth, which is ultimately used for the formation of metabolic water in presence of the oxygen. And it also translocates protons, pumps protons towards the intermembrane space. So one FADH2, and there is a transportation of six protons towards the intermembrane space. So it has refreshed your memory but we will be discussing the role of the fifth complex, which is also called as the ATP synthase complex. Then there is an establishment of a proton motive force. During passage of electrons, now we have seen electrons are passed from NADH as well as FADH to oxygen. Some 10 protons and some 6 protons are respectively collected in the intermembrane space. I have already explained it. Translocation of protons across the inner membrane is electrogenic, that is voltage producing, leading to a formation of a positive charge on the C side of membrane and greater negative charge within the matrix. So there is a difference in the potential now. Inner membrane is mitochondrial inner membrane is basically impermeable to protons. So protons are being translocated. And within the inner membrane, inner intermembrane space, accumulation of protons can result in the establishment of a proton gradient. Or there will be an electrochemical potential gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane. It is possible when protons along with the electron carriers are being translocated towards the intermembrane space in mitochondria. What are the components of the proton gradient? There are two components of proton gradient. One is the hydrogen ion concentration difference or pH gradient. The other component is the voltage that results from the separation of the charge across the membrane. The gradient with concentration, both concentration are chemical and an electrical voltage component is called as electrochemical gradient. And the combined energy present in both components is expressed as proton motive force or delta P. It's measured in millivolts. Now we'll have to see there is an influx of protons. Proton gradient, which is being established now on the one side of the membrane, promotes influx of protons towards matrix side through proton channel, which is formed by 
f0 particles we'll discuss it in detail the proton influx into matrix provides energy to synthesize atp one mole of nadh upon oxidation releases 220 kilojoules of energy and to pump 10 protons in the process only 200 kilojoules of energy is utilized so it is efficient as per the energy is concerned and what for the energy is used energy is required for the release of tightly bound atp product from the catalytic catalytic sites see we have here outer membrane this is the inner intermembrane space this is the inner membrane within this inner membrane there are present the complex one complex second complex third complex four and we have seen the functioning of these complexes they in addition to carrying the electrons they also translocate the protons protons from matrix side from matrix side towards the c side from matrix side towards the c side now it leads to the establishment of a proton gradient or a proton motive force and then we have already seen that there is one more complex which is also named as the complex fifth or that is also named as atp synthase we will discuss it in detail which has an f0 within the inner membrane and f1 particle as a knob within the matrix side and there is also an proton channel and through which protons are being influx of the proton will take place there which will help in the coupling of adp with inorganic phosphate to form atp the details of it will be given in the in the future slides what is basically an atp synthase it is also called as f0 f1 atp synthase atp synthase is a mushroom shaped protein complex it is found embedded in the membranes of mitochondria chloroplasts and bacteria you will see in the membrane of the bacteria it is also present and it is structurally and functionally conserved among species it is composed of it's comprised of two major components namely f1 which is spherical head with 90 angstrom dia and a basal part called f0 which is embedded within the inner mitochondrial membrane headpiece f1 is a peripheral membrane protein complex projecting into the matrix f0 is embedded within crystal membrane of mitochondria and both these subunits that is f1 and f0 are connected by a central and a peripheral stalk f1 head being the catalytic portion of the enzyme is comprised of five different five different polypeptides alpha beta gamma theta and epsilon five polypeptides are highly conserved in many organisms and here you will see three alpha three beta subunits are arranged alternatively within the f1 head resembling the segments of an orange and there are three catalytic sites there are three catalytic sites for atp synthesis one on each beta subunit so we have alpha is a hexamer there is alpha 6 units beta 6 units alpha alpha 3 units beta 3 units so this alpha 3 and beta 3 it forms in hexamer but beta 3 units have the three catalytic sites which are located basically at the alpha beta subunit interfaces the structural details of this complex was given by john e walker and who along with the peter boyle 
shared the Nobel Prize in 1997 in chemistry. As we have already discussed the structure of it, I want to refresh your memory. This is the membrane part of the, in, in, this is the inner mitochondrial membrane. So this portion is called as the F0 particle. This whole portion is called as the F1 particle. This F0 particle is made up of number of C units. And there is also present an A, which has a, which has a role in proton movement. These C units forms the proton channel. And through this, there is a central gamma subunit with which is associated again here an epsilon, epsilon subunit, which is a polypeptide here. This gamma subunit, which is passing through this hexamer, central of the hexamer and center of this uh, uh, channel, these are the beta 3 subunits. These are the alpha 3 subunits. Since this segment and this segment is connected by means of beta one, B1 and B2 proteins, which are acting as a stock. So we have the peripheral stock. We have a central stock here. And peripheral stock has here a theta, a delta here as a polypeptide, which fixes this F1 particle. This is also called as the uh, side arm or it is also called the stator. And this is a rotor which rotates, but here it is stationary because of these two because of these two peripheral polypeptides which acts as a peripheral stock. So this is the structural model of ATP synthase which is located within the plasma membrane of the mitochondria. It was given by E. Walker as I have already mentioned. For this elaborate structure details they share, he shared the Nobel Prize with, with Paul Boyer in 1997 in chemistry. But here is one thing. Uh, the central subunit, which is called as the gamma subunit, is asymmetric in shape. Runs from the outer tip of F1 head and connects with the F0 base piece. F1 particle, as I said, is an integral membrane protein complex comprised of three different polypeptides, namely A, B, and C subunits. The subunit composition is A is 1, B are 2, and C can be from 9 to 12, or the number can vary. And these are responsible, the C are, they are responsible, these C subunits are responsible for the formation of a proton channel or a tunnel. Another connective called as delta subunit exists between F0 and F1 through B1 and B2 handle forming a rigid stator. Rigid stator prevents the rotation of a hexamer. I said F0 is rotating, but F1 is, is, is stationary. That is being prevented by this rigid stator, which rests on the central gamma subunit. The inhibitory function of delta subunit is thought to avoid ATP consumption. Because if it be this, like other enzymes, ATP synthase is also working in a reverse direction. It is responsible for the synthesis of ATP or it can act as an ATP synthase. That time it will result in the hydrolysis of the ATP. According to the binding change mechanism, which was proposed by Paul Boyer in 1989, 93, 97, three catalytic sites located on three beta subunits of F1 particle at any point of time 
are present in different conformations. So we have these three catalytic sites, but they, they are present in different conformations, which make them to have different affinity for nucleotides. What are these catalytic sites? On the beta subunits, three conformations can be loose, tight, and open. Each catalytic site shows change during cycle of catalysis. First, the site is in the open conformation, so that substrate, ADP, and inorganic phosphate occupy the site. As proton pass through F0, the asymmetric central gamma shaft undergoes rotation, displaying three different faces to the catalytic beta subunits causing each site to pass successively through T, O and L, L conformations. We'll explain it here. Since proton influx through the proton channel induces a shift to loose conformation in which substrates are loosely bound. Subsequent proton induces a shift to tight conformation which promotes the tightness of substrate to catalytic site and then there will be a spontaneous condensation that leads to formation of tightly bound ATP. Input of energy is required for the release of tightly bound ATP molecule. Finally, one more proton induces a shift to the open conformation in which affinity for ATP is drastically reduced. So ATP is set free. Paul Boyer and John Walker we are jointly awarded Nobel Prize in 1997 in chemistry for elucidating the ATP synthase model and also for this binding change mechanism. How it is being explained here? It can be explained on a single basis, single uh, this uh, one site, single catalytic site, or it can be the multiple. Here, you'll understand this is the open. When there is an open, that time ADP and inorganic phosphate can come there. But with the influx of the proton, there will be a shift in the central uh, central gamma, gamma stock subunit. That time, the conformation will reach to L, where they will be loosely associated. Then again with the one more proton, it will shift to the T and that time there will be a tightness and there will be formation of ATP. Again, there will be use of energy to have the rotation so that by that rotation, there will be an open conformation and ATP will be released. Setting O again for the next cycle to continue. Similarly, here it is explained on the basis of the three. These are the three sites in, in ATP synthase. And this is the central shaft, which is asymmetric in nature, which will go for these changes in conformation simultaneously. As a result, there will be the generation of ATP and there will be conformational changes in the beta subunits resulting in the generation of ATP and repetition of the cycle. It can be explained with this diagram also. This is the central point, which is the gamma subunit. Once it is fixed to this, that time ADP and inorganic phosphate will, will, will get associated with it. And when there is a change with the influx of the proton, it points to this that time it is loo it, it its conformation becomes loose loosely associated and it is bound and then again when there is a change that time it becomes tight and then when again it comes to open that time there will be the release of the atp and the successively there will be again the loose where atp and inorganic phosphate will be loosely associated so this is the the, the, the main idea of the binding, bind, binding uh, change mechanism 
is that because of the central stock there is a because of its asymmetric nature and because of its rotation there is a shift in the conformations three conformations with a the result there will be the production of atp and three atp will be generated there for each atp synthesis three protons pass through f not across the membrane down the electrochemical proton gradient the passage of three protons across the proton tunnel leads to conformational changes in atp synthase as a result atp adp is coupled with inorganic phosphate forming atp downhill movement of the proton through membrane causes 30 degrees counterclockwise rotation of each subunit of f not particle rotation is caused to the binding of the proton with negatively charged aspartic acid of c subunit thereby bringing second c subunit in alignment with the half channel of the a subunit if c ring is composed of c12 subunits therefore the translocation of 12 protons would lead to the full 360 degrees rotation of c ring as well as central gamma shaft the complete rotation of c subunit together with the gamma shaft in turn synthesizes 3 atp molecules which are subsequently released as per binding change mechanism f not f1 complex harnesses the proton motive force to power atp synthesis it is evident that atp is synthesized by rotational catalysis in which one part of the atp synthase rotates related to another formation of one molecule of atp requires three protons electrical energy stored in the proton gradient is changed into mechanical energy of rotating shaft or a stack which is transduced into chemical energy of atp therefore one nadh reduced nadh produces nearly 3 atp or 2.5 using 10 protons while as fadh2 produces 2 atp or 1.5 as per the uh, latest uh, uh, data using 6 protons it appears from this hypothesis that the true site of atp synthesis is atp synthase complex 1 complex 3 and complex 4 of the etc actually serves as sites of energy conservation helping in the generation of proton motive force so those are the, the areas which are basically responsible for the proton movements and not the generation direct generation of the atp so with this atp synthase acts as a molecular motor this f not f1 atp synthase acts as a tiny rotary motor showing rotation in response to downhill movement of protons atp synthase is a molecular machine that works like a turbine it converts the energy stored in the proton gradient into the chemical energy this enzyme also functions in reverse direction under low electrochemical conditions acting as f1 atpase atpase so it can result in the hydrolysis of the atp at that time first the proton gradient energy is converted into the mechanical rotational energy then rotational energy is transmitted into the y into the gamma shaft attached to the rotor generally three protons are used by atp synthase for the synthesis of one atp molecule one proton is additionally required for adp atp transporters moving adp in and atp out across the membrane see basically mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell it generates atp within the mitochondrial matrix side but most of the atp is to be used outside so there are to be certain transporters which will transport the atp out which will transport the inorganic phosphate or the adp in so for therefore instead of three protons a total of four protons are considered in calculation for the synthesis of one atp the mechanism of atp synthase can be best explained 
can be best explained by this animation presented by Rion Abbott. A concentration gradient of protons across a membrane drives the synthesis of ATP by a large complex in the membrane called ATP synthase. ATP synthase, also called the F1-FO ATP synthase, has two main parts, F1, which protrudes into the cytoplasm, and FO, which sits in the membrane. FO consists of 12 identical subunits designated C. A central stock, called the gamma subunit, extends from FO through F1. Surrounding the gamma subunit in F1 are three pairs of alpha and beta subunits, which serve as the sites of ATP synthesis. Other subunits, designated A and B, connect the F1 knob to the membrane. The proton gradient across the membrane drives FO to rotate. Protons enter through a channel in subunit A and move into the C subunits, causing FO to rotate in 120 degree steps around the axle. Protons are released from the C subunits into the cytoplasm. Note that as FO rotates, the axle also rotates, but F1 does not. F1 is held in place by its connection to the membrane through the A and B subunits. However, the axle turning inside F1 causes F1 to change conformation, catalyzing the formation of ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. An ATP molecule is produced for every three protons that cross the membrane through the ATP synthase channel. This function, in which a proton potential powers ATP production, is highly conserved. ATP synthase complexes with the same general structure can be found in the cell membranes of bacteria, in the inner membranes of mitochondria, and in the thylakoid membranes of chloroplasts. So we have seen that how the ATP is through this animation is actually working for the generation of ATP. Now, what are the evidences in support of this oxidative phosphorylation? There are different evidences. Num numerous experiments have been done. One is the mitochondrial electron transport is associated with net transfer of protons from mitochondrial matrix to the intermembrane space. Number of studies have been conducted, which shows that there is a transfer of protons to the intermembrane space. Second is 
when NADH is added to a suspension of mitochondria, depleted of oxygen, no NADH is oxidized and no pH changes are noticed in the medium. In presence of ample oxygen, in presence of ample oxygen, the pH of the medium becomes acidic, largely due to the increase in proton outside the mitochondria. That means if this is an experimenter experiment done here, demonstration of electron transport coupled to proton transport across the membrane. Mitochondria is taken here, and this is a sealed structure. Here, when there is no oxygen and there is a pH electrode which gives us what is the pH of the medium. When there is no oxygen, there is less pH in the medium. But when oxygen is given, the ample oxygen is given there, that time what happens? There is a change in the pH also in the, in the medium. This experiment clearly demonstrates that electron transport from the NADH or FADH to oxygen is coupled to proton transport across the membrane. So it has to reach to the oxygen. Once oxygen is not there, there will be no movement of no uh, transportation of the electrons and no uh, pumping of protons. In addition to this intact inner mitochondrial membrane is impermeable to protons. It has been seen and to hydroxyl ions, potassium and except in the region of elementary particles which harbors electron transport carriers. So rest whole membrane is impermeable. It is only permeable in the Christi area where the elementary particles are present. And also there are certain uncouplers which have been used. Use of uncouplers. Number of compounds uncouple. There is a coupling between oxygen and electron transport chain. Coupling between oxygen and electron transport carriers. Number of compounds uncouple are delink oxidative phosphorylation from ETC. Many uncouplers uncouplers like 2,4-dinitrophenol, 2,4-D, dicumoral makes the inner membrane leaky to proton, thus prevents the buildup of sufficient electrochemical gradient because uncoupler will make the membrane leaky. There will be the movement of protons from one side to other side. They will not come through the complex 5 where ATP would, ATP would have been generated. Instead, they will come directly in the matrix and there is no generation of electrochemical gradient or no synthesis of ATP. So uncouplers inhibits the ATP synthesis. See, interestingly, many physicians during 1920s used to prescribe the DNP, this dinitrophenol as a diet pill to obese patients because it will oxidize the extra fats to, to have the normal ATP production produced. So there will be more um, extra fats utilized, less energy produced, just to maintain the ATP level. But ultimately, because of certain reasons, this was not, then in, was not used later on. ATP can be generated in isolated mitochondria by increasing proton ion concentration through addition of acid on outside of the mitochondria, creating a potential pH difference between the inside and outside. So you can generate an ATP in an isolated mitochondria. Take an isolated mitochondria, make a potential difference, pH difference between the two. There will be the creation of a potential uh, pH difference that will lead to the generation of ATP. In addition to this, one direct evidence of ATP synthesis is forced magnetic rotation of gamma subunit. A microscopic magnetic bead was attached to the apex of 
gamma subunit of a genetically engineered F1 molecule. Place it in a transparent microchamber filled with ADP and inorganic phosphate. The forced rotation in clockwise direction of gamma subunit led to the synthesis of ATP in micromolar concentrations. But upon removal of the magnetic field, the gamma subunit shaft rotates spontaneously in reverse direction owing to the hydrolysis of recently synthesized ATP. They are going to establish that there is a rotary mechanism. The ATP synthase is acting as a turbine-like structure. It has been done with forced magnetic rotation of gamma subunit. Also, there is a demonstration on liposomes. Liposomes are inside-out sub-mitochondrial vesicles. Vesicles formed due to ultrasonic disruption of inner mitochondrial membrane having F1 particle facing outside. So, liposome is capable of both electron transport and ATP synthesis. Upon separation by mechanical agitation, intact F0 membrane is capable of electron transport while F1 functions as ATPs. The reconstituted uh, uh, this uh, vesicle is capable of both electron transport and ATP synthesis. Let us see it. This is an inner mitochondrial membrane. Treatment with ultrasonic vibrations. There is a disruption here and it forms this way. Elementary particles F1, F0 and F1 they remain on the outside of it. So these are inside out sub mitochondrial capable of both electron transport and ATP synthesis. Now this is subjected to mechanical agitation. So there is a membrane bound F, F0 particle and there are separate F1. These F1 will act as ATPs because I said once it is free, once it is isolated, it will have a reverse function. That time it will not be ATP synthase, it will be ATPs. It will show a rotation, hydrolysis of ATP. And once both are reconstituted and they are reconstituted, they will resume the function of both electron transport chain as well as the ATP synthesis. This is the experimental demonstration, live experimental demonstration on uh, liposomes indicating the role of F0 and F0, F1 and F0 particles. There is a high resolution X-ray studies of F1 ATPase from bovine mitochondria confirmed the binding change mechanism hypothesis and experimentally supported the rotational model for catalytic mechanism of ATP synthesis. This is Abraham's 1994. There is a direct convincing evidence about rotational catalysis of ATP synthase. It was given by these scientists in 1997. They used a genetically engineered version of F1 portion of ATP synthase. What they did? They fixed this alpha 3, beta 3 and shaft complex on a gloss cover slip. The beta subunits were modified to have histidine side chain which have affinity for nickel NTA, nickel nitri nitri nitrilo triacetic acid substance used to coat the cover slip. So genetically engineered F1 particle, its beta subunits modified so that it gets fixed and immobilized on the cover slip. Alpha subunit, this gamma subunit apex was modified. 
it was also modified by substitution of serine by cysteine residue and to this modified tip was attached a fluorescently labeled actin filament whose length was this to this micrometer and a diameter of 10 nanometer a very short filament was used as a rotational marker since imaging of fluorescently labeled actin filament suffers from photo bleaching this time we have a choice we use new probes such as polycystrine beads gold collide bead colloidal beads gold nano rods magnetic beads these are also frequently used now and in presence of an atp so what they did they genetically engineered it and also in presence of atp they found that actin filament showed counterclockwise rotation just like microscopic propeller it is the diagram of it this is the cover slip these are the beta beta alpha beta beta were modified with this histidine chain side chains on beta subunit having affinity for nickel nta so it is fixed here and the head of this which is on the other side towards the f not side this head of this gamma shaft is modified also and so that this actin filament is attached to it and then under microscope they saw the movement of this actin filament in a counter clockwise direction so this is genetically engineered atp synthase showing rotational catalysis it can be also seen with one of the animations how actin filament acts as a microscopic propeller and in presence of an atp showing counter clockwise rotation is explained with this animation by this animation to show the rotation of the central shaft a short fluorescent actin filament was experimentally attached to it single filaments attached to single f1 atp aces can be visualized in the microscope when atp is added the filament starts spinning directly demonstrating the mechanical properties of this remarkable molecular machine so with this animation we have seen that overall what we mean by the oxidative phosphorylation how electron transport is responsible for the generation of proton motive force how proton motive force is used for coupling or conformational changes of atp synthase which results in the synthesis of atp and how different experimental evidences have been there to prove that this atp synthase works as a molecular machine that works like a turbine which converts the energy stored in the proton gradient into a chemical energy that is atp stored in the form of atp in the next video we will be discussing photophosphorylation till then take care be safe goodbye thank you